Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 103 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and I'm joined today by Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, this is a special bonus episode that we recorded to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash StarQuest for their generosity in making this and all our shows at StarQuest possible. We gave them early, exclusive access, but now we're sharing it with you to show you one of the benefits of being a patron. Here's the show. Welcome to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, which is made possible by you, our patrons on Patreon. We're always looking for ways to thank you for your generosity in making all our shows on StarQuest possible, and this is one of those ways. In the past, we've reached out to and asked if you had questions you'd like to ask, and we got many, many great responses. So many, in fact, the last time that we still had some left over that we're, we're going to be talking about today. And that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, how will we be handling the questions today? We'll answer as many as we can, and we want to thank as many people as possible. So if you ask more than one uh, question that we still haven't gotten to, we'll save it for the future. Answers will have to be brief, but we'll be devoting full shows to many of these mysteries in the future. And we'll cover as many things as we can here. All right. So our first question comes from Joseph Grabowski, who's, who writes, Some people talk a lot about dangers associated with yoga and transcendental meditation and the use of certain mantras. I once had a friend who was given a Buddha statue as a gift and buried it because he didn't want it in his house. And then there's the whole Harry Potter debate. The point is, it seems to be that there's, an ironic, that there's ironically a lot of superstition regarding evil practices and objects. But if we look at the way blessed objects and sacramentals work, ex opere apparatus, couldn't we extrapolate from this a, a principle for understanding how curses and hexes and such must work? Wouldn't these ultimately re really rely upon the intent and disposition of the user more than anything else? Yeah, so I think Joseph has a really good point here. There is a lot of superstition about non-Christian objects and practices and thinking that they are going to be harmful in some way that they're not. Like if you have a Buddha statue, it's got a demon in it because it's always demons. Right. You know, and, and really, you know, I can't eliminate the possibility that in some cases these things happen, but we don't need to run around being terrified by them and being afraid of anything that's not 100 percent certified Catholic. In particular, with, you know, things like stories and literature and stuff, you're not opening yourself to demons by reading a book that has magic in it, like Lord of the Rings or Narnia. And superstition, as we'll discuss in episode 79, which may be past or future, depending on whether you're a patron and you're when you're hearing this, we're going to be discussing the concepts of religion, magic, uh, psychic phenomena, science, and superstition. And superstition basically is attributing too much significance to something, believing in something too much, and especially of a religious nature. And if you're thinking that every Buddha statue you see is a potential threat that has a demon in it, you're being superstitious. That's not to say we don't need to be on guard and careful about our faith, but it, do mean, it does mean we don't need to be natively suspicious of every single thing as having a curse on it. And by the way, we will be talking about curses in future episodes. Michael O'Donnell uh, writes, I recently encountered an online debate over whether or not the Byzantine Catholic Church was right to venerate another archangel by name that comes from a book they claimed was canonical, but Latin rite canons say is apocryphal. Is there an official church position on this issue? So the angel in question is called Uriel. And Uriel in Hebrew could mean either light of God, which is, or God is my light, which is how it's often translated. It could also be translated fire of God. 
And obviously, you know, God, our God is a consuming fire. So, it, you know, fiery imagery and light imagery are both associated with God. Uriel is mentioned in books like Second Esdras, also known as Fourth Esdras. Also, Uriel appears in First Enoch. He seems to be mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's mentioned in the Life of Adam and Eve and in the Sibylline Oracles. And so actually, Uriel was quite widely discussed in the literature uh, just preceding the time of Jesus and just following the time of Jesus. There was a widespread popular belief that there was this angel named God is my light or light of God. And the book that is included in Eastern Orthodox canons, but not in the Catholic canon, including not in the Byzantine Catholic canon, is the second Esdras book. You will find that in various editions of the Septuagint, and sometimes you even find it printed in Catholic Bibles, even though it's not considered canonical by Catholics. From what I've been able to determine in Eastern Catholicism, uh, there is a veneration of Uriel, and that raises the question of, does somebody have to be mentioned in the Bible in order to be venerated? And unless we're applying some kind of sola scriptura principle, the answer would seem to be no. I mean, all the saints that lived after the time of the Bible, none of them are mentioned in the Bible, but we can, you know, venerate them. And so if there's this angel who gets mentioned prominently in the literature of this period, that could reflect an accurate understanding. Even though the literature is not inspired, it doesn't mean this angel doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean that a particular um, uh, church within the Catholic Church can't venerate this angel. Um, it, so I don't see an intrinsic problem here. Also, you have, I should note, Uriel features prominently in First Enoch, and First Enoch is even quoted in the Bible. It's quoted in the book of Jude. And so biblical authors were familiar with and had some significant respect for uh, First Enoch, where Uriel appears. So I, I, I wouldn't um, particularly stress about this. The church tends to, when there's a reconciliation between uh, the Catholic Church and some church that previously was separate but now is back in full communion, as is the case with the Byzantine Catholic Church, their liturgical calendar and the saints on it is not challenged. So since they had Uriel on their calendar, the church doesn't have a problem with them continuing to venerate Uriel. Uh, Michaela Knipe uh, writes, Jimmy and Dom, I've always been curious about bilocation. I know Padre Pio and several other saints have had these experiences. Can you help explain a bit more about this phenomenon and how it occurs or for what reason it has occurred? I know there have been many times I wished I could bilocate to help me be in many places at once. Keep up the great work. Yeah, I, as a parent, I have also wished to be able to bilocate at times. Yeah. <laughs> so bilocation is a phenomenon that is reported. Uh, it's a mystical phenomenon that it's reported where a person will be in more than one place at a time. And it's reported in the case of various saints that they would be seen in one location, even though they were somewhere else. And, you know, some of that can just be mistaken identity. I mean, that happens all the time. But the saints themselves sometimes report, I was mystically, I was, I fell into a trance and was mystically somewhere else. In terms of the nature of this, well, some form of appearance in more than one place is clearly possible, according to Catholic theology, as we see with the Eucharist, which is described not as bilocating, but as multilocating. Jesus appears in many places at once in the Eucharist. But you'll notice he doesn't appear in his physical, with his physical body extended in space to where you could look and say, oh, that's Jesus. That's what's called in theology sometimes circumscriptive presence. So when you see a body extended in space in the normal way where you could like touch it and touch different parts of it, that's circumscriptive location. But there's also something that's called definitive location. And definitive location occurs when a thing is present not in this extended way, but in a way that the entirety of the thing 
and this is a little hard to understand, but the entirety of the thing is present in every part of a location. Mm -hmm. And an example of this is the human soul. The soul is not a physically extended thing, but the soul animates every part of your body and is present in every part of your body all at once. And so your soul has a definitive location in your body, but it's not located there circumscriptively to where you could like say, oh, this is the arm of the soul and this is the toe of the soul and things like that. And that's also the way that Jesus is present in the Eucharist. He's present, according to theologians, by definitive location in the Eucharist rather than by circumscriptive location. And that leads to a discussion among theologians about is it possible for a physical body to be present circumscriptively in more than one place at a time. And a variety of theologians, including Aquinas, say no, that you can't have, you can't have like, here's the body of, of Padre Pio in this town in Italy, and then here's this, the body of Padre Pio simultaneously manifesting in this other town in Italy, and have them both equally be his real body. And so what Aquinas would do to explain that is say that um, one of the bodies, the one that's not his normal one, or that one of them is not his normal body, it's some kind of manifestation, like it's a secondary body, or it's a a visionary body or something like that. So it's, he's not really, his body is not really in two places at one time. It's some kind of other manifestation. It's like an avatar, you know, if you remember the movie Avatar. Mm -hmm. The other theologians, though, including some very highly respected historical theologians, have said, no, a God could, if he wanted, uh, make a body appear in more than one place at a time. And that's what he's doing in these cases. Recent scientific discoveries and theories have perhaps lent some additional support to the idea of something being in more than one place at a time. In quantum mechanics, for example, it's very commonly, and not every understanding of quantum mechanics has this, but many understandings or interpretations of quantum mechanics hold that it is possible at least on the quantum scale for subatomic very small things like subatomic particles and atoms to be in more than one place at a single time that's what's known as a superposition mm -hmm. and so it it could be in more than one place at a time and then when you measure it it crystallizes into being in just one place and so that could be hypothetically related to bilocation. Also, we now know, and this is connected with the other major theory in physics, not quantum mechanics, but relativity, which deals with the scale of the very big, it turns out space and time are not absolutes, the way it was assumed in Aquinas's day. In Aquinas's day, it could be very hard to see how a single body could be circumscriptively present in more than one place. But if you can bend space and time so that they loop back on each other, you could have a single body in more than one place at a time. And so another modern scientific idea could lend support to the more realist understanding of what bilocation is. Having said that, there are other possibilities. You know, uh, some saints have said, well, I went into a trance and then I experienced being in this other place. And, you know, a psychic researcher might come along and say, "Ooh, astral projection or remote viewing coupled with, you know, if they affected something there, telekinesis or other people, you know, got to see them in a vision there. So some kind of, you know, maybe telepathic contact or God giving people a vision. And so there are other ways that this could also be accomplished aside from a single body being circumscriptively present in more than one location. And all of those are just ideas, though, and I haven't personally done a lot of research into bilocation yet, but it is on the list for things to research and talk about in future episodes. Excellent. Kathleen Hamalinen writes, Hello, Jimmy and Dom. I'd like to know about the mystery of the Superstition Mountains in Arizona. Yeah, so they got a great name, don't they? <laughs> yes. The Superstition Mountains are famous for a few mysteries. The most famous of them is it's the supposed location of where the Lost Dutchman's gold mine is. And the Lost Dutchman actually wasn't Dutch. He was German. But at the time, Germany Deutsch. and... Deutsch, yeah, Dutch. Yeah, yep. yeah. 
also there is an Apache legend that there's a hole in the Superstition Mountains that goes to the lower world. Mm. So that's also part of the legend, but that's not as famous as Lost Dutchman. And in the future, we will be talking about the Superstition Mountains. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> if it's named Superstition Mountains, you know there's a mystery there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Rhea Beach writes, Howdy, Jimmy from Texas. Can you talk a bit and give your thoughts about David Paulides' documentary about missing people in the national parks? Yeah, so uh, David Paulides is a sort of paranormal investigator. He has investigated Bigfoot, but recently he's been more famous for doing a series of uh, books and documentaries called Missing 411. And the basic idea of these is he thinks he's uncovered a large number of inexplicable disappearances in national parks. And in some cases, the people involved in these disappearances have then mysteriously reappeared in really unexpected ways. Like you'll have a child who is five years old or less that disappeared from a campsite and then appeared miles away at the top of a hill without the scratches you would expect and how did this kid get there and cross all this distance in this rough terrain and and has no memory or has weird memories of what happened in mm. the interim and so and he doesn't claim to have a definitive explanation for these things but he thinks that the national park service is being irresponsible in how it handles these cases uh that according to various claims there either is or isn't a comprehensive listing of these things that you would kind of expect them to have. Mm. But if there is one, it has not been released to the public. And so I think he has like FOIA requests trying to get access to the records on these things. And he says he's talked to park workers who say that the parks really, the higher ups want this, don't really want to look into this issue. They kind of want it to go away. But according to Polites, there is a, a statistically anomalous number of people going missing under weird circumstances. Now, critics will push back on that and say there are all kinds of things that happen out in parks. People can fall off cliffs and disappear very suddenly and their bodies don't get found. Um, there can be animal predation. People can drown. All kinds of different things can happen. And they would argue that it's really not a statistically significant number of people, or at least not the number that Paulides thinks it is. So I've got Paulides on my radar, and he's on the list to talk about in the future. One of the problems in researching him, though, is his he hasn't made his books available electronically. And it's much easier for me to research in electronic form than it is in with physical media. Jonathan L. has a has a bunch of questions. Jimmy, how would you like to handle this? You want to do a one at a time? Yeah, they're all short. Let's do them. Uh, we'll just, just do them all. Okay, awesome. Uh, so Jonathan writes, if someone is a devout Catholic from birth to age 30, then gets a traumatic brain injury due to an accident and emerges an atheist, which they remain until they die many years later, would they go to heaven or hell? Same question again, only starting out as atheist and becoming Catholic due to injury. So if someone starts out as a Catholic and then has a brain injury and they become an atheist, I would as assuming that the brain injury was what was responsible for that. Well, then the brain injury would have deprived them of the normal use of human freedom. If you're saying that's why it's not because they chose to become an atheist, it's because they had a brain injury. Well, in that case, they, the fact that they became an atheist without the sufficient use of free will would mean that there is no change in whether they're in a state of grace because you're not responsible for things that you don't freely do. Now, they might otherwise go in if they still have sufficient use of free will in other matters, they they might go on to commit mortal sins, but then they also might repent of those even in a way that doesn't result in them having a conscious belief in God. And, you know, it is possible for atheists to be saved if they, even though they don't believe in God, if they otherwise live up to the light and the grace that they have received. And so someone becoming an atheist due to a brain injury that deprives them of free will in that matter, that wouldn't change their state of grace, but it wouldn't if they're in a state of grace, but it also wouldn't say anything definitive about whether they would go to heaven or hell one way or the other. It would depend on other factors. 
In the case of someone who starts out as an atheist and gets a brain injury that results in them becoming a Catholic without the use of free will, well, the sacraments work as long as you don't oppose them by free will. And so if your will at the moment of baptism is not opposing receiving grace in the baptism, then you'll receive it. And so there would be an argument that in this case, this person would sort of be like an infant being baptized. He's not really choosing baptism, but he's also not opposing it. And so he, you could argue he will receive the grace of baptism, including the infused virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And you could argue, on the other hand, well, maybe he has a deep fundamental option opposing this that remains even though he's had the brain injury. That's how you would argue. You'd have to say there's still some underlying un subconscious or implicit rejection of the faith in order to argue that, that, that baptism wouldn't have its effect here. But I think the better case is probably that it would. Uh, however, even though he becomes Catholic and even if he gets the graces of baptism, he can still go on to commit other mortal sin and lose it. And so being a Catholic or being an atheist is not a guarantee of heaven or hell one way or the other. It depends on more than one thing. Okay. Uh, his next question is, does the teaching that God brings good out of all evil have any practical value or meaning to those who end up damned? The argument would be that it's still better for the damned to exist rather than not exist. And so even if they're being held accountable for what they did, they still end up on the plus side of things. And so even for them, the argument would be they're benefiting from existing and that uh, and that's some of the good that God has brought out of the situation, even though they've messed it up. So it's not as good as it could be by their own free will. Okay. And then next he ask, would it be against any Catholic doctrine to believe that hell isn't terrible suffering in itself, but only compared to the beatitude that these damned don't experience? This is not strictly ruled out. The church does not have a teaching about I mean, you can search contemporary magisterial documents. You're not going to find any teaching that says hell must be conceived of as the greatest possible suffering or things like that. You, that's been a common theological opinion down through history, but you don't have that in contemporary magisterial documents. Scripture does use imagery indicating, you know, kind of to the extent our minds can comprehend it what the suffering of hell would be like, and it uses different imagery. Imagery, Not all of the images it uses suggest the same level of suffering. Some use fire, and obviously burning is really painful. Others, though, compare it to being cast out into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and sometimes the weeping is, is not the same as being burned. You know, that, that right. kind of emotional anguish. Also, the gnashing of teeth, I mean, that could be gnashing due to emotional reasons, but I've also seen it suggested that that's chattering of teeth because how cold it is out in the darkness instead of being allowed into the nice warm house. Having being cold enough that your teeth chatter is also not the same thing as fire. And so we have a mix of images in scripture that are used to depict this suffering, and none of them seems to have a definitive value over the others. And so it remains an area for speculation exactly how, how much suffering this involves. Okay. And, and thus, some people have proposed that maybe it's not actually that bad from an absolute scale, but it is bad compared to the glory of heaven. An example of this kind of hell if you want to see a literary depiction of it, check out C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. And he has a kind of imaginative exercise of what this kind of hell would be like. And then his, his last question is, can a Catholic in good standing be an anarchist, meaning an advocate for a society that does not have a standing government, not meaning actively using violence against an existing government? Right. So philosophical anarchism as opposed to violent revolutionary anarchism. Okay, so here's what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. In paragraph 1879, it says, Human society can be neither well-ordered nor prosperous unless it has some people invested with legitimate authority to preserve its institutions and devote themselves as far as necessary to work and care for the good of all. 
By authority, one means the quality by virtue of which persons or institutions make laws and give orders to men and expect obedience from them. And then in the next paragraph, it continues and says, every human community needs an authority to govern it. And that's what we would call a government. The foundation of such authority lies in human nature. It is necessary for the unity of the state. Its role is to ensure as far as possible the common good of society. And that just seems to be something that is part of human nature. The Even if you look at our close relatives like chimpanzees and stuff or gorillas, a given band of them is going to have leaders. And humans spontaneously organize with certain people as leaders, even, even in informal groups. If you have a group of friends and they're deciding what to do, you know, what go out to a movie or a restaurant, some person or group of persons tends to take the lead in figuring that out. So humans naturally have leadership emerge. And if you have big groups where you have real stakes on the line, like are we going to survive or not, say a famine or an invasion, you really need leaders with authority. So I would say it's very hard to see how the idea of philosophical anarchism would square with human nature or with Catholic teaching. If you wanted to propose something other than a government to take care of the basic needs of societal organization, then that would be possible, but you need to have a realistic way to do that. And I'm not sure what that would be. And if you do propose some mechanism, like everybody gets to be king for a day, and, well, okay, then you've just got a government that rapidly changes hands. Right. So, uh, and if you propose, like, everybody gets a little electronic device where they can vote on every single question and everything is determined by majority rule, Still that's a not going to be, it, well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it sort of is, but also it's not going to be practical to consult everybody on every single question that society needs to answer. Right. And so I don't see, if, even if you call it something else, I think you're really introducing a crypto government or your society is going to fall apart. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that last one is, it's democracy. It's a form of government, but yeah. Patrick writes, Howdy, Jimmy and Dom. Did the Tennessee prophet have any other as of yet unfulfilled prophecies? And if not, what do you suppose God's message or lesson to us is about this prophet and his prophecies? So we talked about John Hendricks, the Tennessee prophet, back in episode 44, and we mentioned he did have some prophecies that hadn't come true. One of them was that the town that was going to be built that is now Oak Ridge, Tennessee, was going to be named Paradise. And that hasn't happened to this point. And I don't know that it ever will. Also, in terms of what the message would have been for people, it could have simply been a sign of God's presence. You know, God's letting them know by showing John Hendricks some of the things that are going to be happening in this area. God's showing that he's real and that he has real contact with people. So that could have been part of the purpose. There also could have been other purposes, like a moral warning that also came through Hendrix, who did morally warn about things. He said the county workhouse was an evil place and would be destroyed, and it was. But because we're dependent on oral history here and what people remembered him saying, because he didn't write his prophecies down, they may have just, as we mentioned, they may have just been impressed by the ones that came true and kind of forgot about the moral message. Because people tend to do that. You know, they get impressed by, wow, this amazing prophecy came true, and then they forget about the moral message that was attached to it. Uh, I would say, though, it, on the prophecies coming true, if I lived in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and if any of you do, I propose that you, w I would run for office on, say, the city council on the platform mm -hmm. of, we need to change the name of the city to Paradise. Just, just, uh -huh. just for, sure. That would certainly be a fun <laughs> election campaign. Yeah. <laughs> so Ruth writes, we often hear about schools of dolphins washing up on beaches all dead, and it's always unexplained. There are speculations about why, like sonar from naval activity disorienting and confusing the dolphins. But each time there's been an air of mystery. What, what do you think? Yeah. So and this doesn't just happen with dolphins. It also happens, you know, with whales. And these are because dolphins and whales are a kind of animal known as a cetacean, a marine mammal. These are called cetacean strandings. 
And uh, Wikipedia has a page on them, which we'll link to. According to Wikipedia, several explanations for why cetaceans strand themselves have been proposed, including changes in water temperature, peculiarities of whales' echolocations in certain surroundings, and geomagnetic disturbances. But none have so far been universally accepted as a definitive reason for the behavior. However, a link between the mass beaching of beaked whales and the use of mid-frequency active sonar has been found. My own thoughts, and I haven't studied this in detail, but my own thoughts is that these things are accidental and in part based, it's not like they're trying to kill themselves. They're doing something else that then gets them up on the beach in a way where they can't extricate themselves. And this is probably partially conditioned by herd behavior on their part because they do travel in groups, like in the case of, you know, called pods and so forth. And so a pod will be doing something and either the leaders in the pod or whoever temporarily has influence maybe has a panic response to something in the environment and flees from it and ends up beached. And because everyone else is conditioned to, ooh, there's a, someone's panicking, we better get out of here, they all end up beaching themselves too. I've also seen other explanations proposed like hunting. Apparently, sometimes whales who are hunting seals that hang out on the beach will come up on the beach to get a seal and expect to be washed back out to sea by a wave. But then the wave may not happen. If they get a little too far up on the beach and the wave doesn't pull them back. And if they are hunting as a group, the same kind of thing could happen. Okay. Yeah. Sort of, they're sort of like lemmings following the leader uh, in that sense. Mm-hmm. Although that's a myth, isn't it? The lemmings all following yeah. the, yeah. <laughs> Which is another to some, mystery. To, to <laughs> some extent. Yeah. Uh, Tristram Carlyle writes, would love to hear about Oak Island. Oh, Tristram, I would too. Uh, it's one of my favorite <laughs> subjects from when I was a kid. Uh, he says, Please be sure to get the latest information if you do choose the subject, because every year they're finding something, it seems, even if it's not gold bars. So Oak Island is a location where there is alleged to be valuable stuff buried, including gold bars and the treasure of the Knights Templar and maybe the Holy Grail or maybe just stuff pirates had. And we will talk about it in a future episode. It's on the list. And I always check the current status of things when I'm doing research. So that will be part of it. I am looking forward to that one. Uh, Jonathan Hill writes, Hey, Jimmy and Dom, do you guys have a take on the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald in Lake Superior in the 1970s? If so, what's your theory about the sinking? I've read the official Coast Guard report, but I know a lot of Great Lakes sailors don't buy it. Thanks. There are a bunch of proposals about exactly what sank the Edmund Fitzgerald or why the Edmund Fitzgerald sank. I'm not familiar with the details of the case. I mean, obviously, I know the song by Gordon Lightfoot, um, but I know some of the proposals include a, a combination of weather and waves. Big waves overwhelmed the ship. It may have also been a rogue wave, one of these freakishly super big waves. There are also proposals that the hatches on the cargo hold had not been properly sealed, and so the cargo hold flooded and took the ship down. It's also been proposed it hit a shoal, and it's been proposed that the the hull had a stress fracture that eventually gave way under the pressure of the water and the waves and caused uh, the ship to experience structural failure. I don't know the answer on this one, but I've added it to the list. Excellent. Les J. Record, or Record, says, hey, Jimmy, what do you think of the Loch, what do you think the Loch Ness Monster really is? Oh, well, it's clearly a Zygon war beast known as a Scarison. I am in I complete mean, agreement with that. I've seen yeah. that Doctor Who episode, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the Loch Ness Monster is a combination of the most likely answer is that the Loch Ness Monster is a combination of legend, misidentification of things that are in the water including sometimes like logs, and deliberate hoaxes, like the famous photo from early in the 20th century that's now known to be a hoax. If it is something actually an animal that's the basis of this legend, Big Eel is the most likely possibility. Yeah, and uh, if if you do want to find out more about the uh, Doctor Who episode where, that we're referring to, it's from the fourth Doctor's time, and we recently talked about it on uh, Secrets of Doctor Who. Check Terror of the Zygons. Terror of the Zygons. It was episode 152 
of the secrets of Doctor Who, and you can check that out. It, that is actually a lot of fun to uh, to watch. So uh, check mm-hmm. it out. Felix Lopez Ferrer says, "I would like a discussion on what happened before U boat U five thirty surrendered to Argentina at the end of World War II." So this U boat or submarine surrendered late after the war ended, like two months late. And when it surrendered, it was missing a big gun that it was supposed to have. And the crew had no IDs and there was no mission log. And so it's as if they were deliberately covering up what had happened in the intervening two months and were planning on dispersing and they'd obscured their identities so they couldn't be held accountable for what may have happened in those two months. And so there are various theories about what happened in those two months. One of them is that they were transporting Nazi leaders like Hitler and his new wife, Eva Braun. Also, it's been suggested they had sunk a Brazilian cruiser called the Bahia. And so that could be a kind of war, you know, or post-war crime that you wanted to not get held accountable for when you finally surrendered. This is not the only U-boat that there is a mystery surrounding. Another U-boat that is similar and that also has been suggested as an escape route for Hitler is U-977. And I've put both U-530 and U-977 on the lists to discuss in future episodes. Okay. Uh, Lizzie Grayson writes, did Noah's Ark really happen If so, what is the evidence for this? And if not, what is the symbolic meaning of the story in the Bible? Well, the primary evidence for Noah's Ark is found in the Bible. There are parallel flood stories told by other cultures, but, you know, the guys involved aren't named Noah. You know, like in the Babylonian equivalent, actually there's more than one, but in the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, the equivalent of Noah is named Utnapishtim. In the Greek version, the equivalent of Noah is named Deucalion. There have been modern expeditions to Mount Ararat in Turkey that have had inconclusive results. Most scientists and biblical scholars do not think that they're going to find the Ark. In terms of what genre of literature Noah's Ark is, you'll notice it falls in the first 12 chapters of Genesis. In fact, it falls smack dab in the middle of the first 12 chapters of Genesis. This is what's sometimes called the primordial history. And one of the things that um, the church has recognized is that the primordial history is different than in character than later history in the Bible, including later on in the book of Genesis. The style of writing changes significantly once we get to Abraham. And we, it, suddenly things are becoming much more concrete with much more historical detail. And it it looks like the primordial history, even though it contains real memories of things that happened, is significantly reconstructed rather than being based on firsthand records. Where the firsthand records really kick in is when Hebrew writing kicks in. The earliest Hebrew writing is approximately 1000 BC, approximately the time of King David. And once they start keeping court records, That's when history in the Old Testament becomes really much clearer and preciser and datable and archaeology. We can find stuff and so forth. And before that, you know, people had oral tradition to preserve information, but oral tradition doesn't let you create a permanent record the way writing does. And so there's an element when you're relying strictly on oral tradition and not on eyewitness stuff and not on written records, there's an element of reconstruction that's part of the telling of these stories. And at really remote periods, like before Abraham, there's going to be more reconstruction. And so the church, for example, in, in not just in the catechism, but in the catechism and in other documents, acknowledges that like in the Genesis narrative, it uses symbolic language to communicate real stuff. You know, like the week of creation uses the symbol of a week to convey the work the creator really did. And similarly, the catechism says that the account of the fall of man uses figurative language to communicate an event that really did happen at the dawn of human history where our race turned away from God. 
And since Noah's Ark falls in this same period and is part of the same kind of literature, you would expect Noah's Ark to be sort of in this middle zone where it's, you know, incorporating real things from history, but also is told in a reconstructed and potentially partially symbolic way. In terms of the messages that we can infer from this, whether it was fully literal or something kind of a mixture, the lessons clearly are that sin has consequences and that even though sin has consequences and when disasters occur, it's not because God is a bad God. God will also preserve his remnant through a faithful people through the disaster. So you want to be faithful to God and that God is not going to bring this kind of calamity again, that the, in, in, certainly, at least not before the end of the world, this kind of calamity is unique. So those would be, I guess, a few thoughts on the basic question. I, I do remember reading a few years ago an article about some marine archaeology that was done in the Black Sea, where mm -hmm. below a certain depth, there's no aerobic activity. So things don't degrade due to you know cellular decay like they do in where there mm -hmm. is. And that they've, to, long story short, they believe that the Bosphorus, which is that what the waterway that connects the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, uh, once w was not there, that it was land. Some mm -hmm. event, cataclysmic event happened that opened it up and flooded what is now the Black Sea in a rapid fashion that caused people to have to flee their homes uh, suddenly. And this mm -hmm. huge flooding event entered into the history of many peoples. And that's entirely possible. I'm yep. aware of that as well. I think we've even linked that in Mysterious Headlines before. Okay. But yeah, there have been a number of proposals for events that could have could have been the basis of the Great Flood. Interesting. Okay, so moving on, Mike and Angie Grotham, uh, they had a Halloween slash spooky themed uh, questions. Uh, first, will there be an episode on voodoo? And can they yes. really bring people back from the dead zombie style? We will have uh, discussions of voodoo and zombies in future episodes. He he also mentions he assumes that the zombies, if they could be brought back by voodoo practitioners, would just be demonic. Actually. Um, I would think there are other possibilities that would be more likely than voodoo practitioners g being able to really get a demon to reanimate a dead body. There was a book, actually more than one book, but one of them that appeared back in the 80s, I believe, was called The Serpent in the Rainbow, and it proposed a pharmacological explanation for zombies that mm -hmm. you could give a person a combination of drugs that would make them that would knock them out and make them appear dead and then subsequently would alter their personality and make them malleable and you know kind of brain damaged but you could get labor out of them so that's there are multiple explanations for what zombies might be including naturalistic explanations like the pharmacological hypothesis, and we'll be talking about that in future episodes as well. And then the uh, second part of the question is, uh, I'd love to hear your opinion on my zombie apocalypse theory. If a demon can control an object, couldn't a demon control a dead body or dead person, making it look like the dead person is a zombie, hence tricking people into thinking a zombie apocalypse is happening, and then the zombie could bite and kill the human, and then the dead human is, quote, infected with another demon, creating another zombie and repeat. It's logically possible. You know, I don't see anything. There's no contradiction in the terms that would keep it from happening, but it would be unprecedented. And it also seems to be unforeseen in biblical prophecy. So I don't expect this to happen. Very good. I don't want any zombie apocalypses. So Phil S. Uh, writes, Scripture says that a great chasm has been established between heaven and hell to prevent traveling between them. Is chasm an accurate translation? And if so, if one could hypothetically enter the chasm, what do you think would be the characteristics of such a place? So this statement is uh, found in Jesus's parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, the specific verse that mentions the chasm is Luke sixteen twenty six, And in the Greek, in this verse, the word for chasm is chasma. So you can hear just directly, this word has just been brought directly over from Greek, chasma to chasm in English. 
And the translation chasm is a fine translation. The word in Greek can also mean yawn, like you're yawning your mouth, or gape, like you're gaping your mouth. But when you apply it to a geological feature, it's a big gap or a chasm. And so it's a perfectly fine translation here. I don't think, though, that we should expect this to be a physical gap because we're talking, it's in, number one, it's in a parable or at least what appears to be a parable. And number two, it's in the afterlife. And none of the parties involved, whether Lazarus, the rich man, or Abraham, none of them have bodies. So thinking of this as a physical gap, I think, is problematic. I think it's more naturally understood as a metaphor for the inability to cross from the state of the blessed to the state of the damned and back. It's not really a physical structure in the afterlife. It's just a symbol of the fact that one cannot move between the states of being blessed and being lost. Could just as easily have been used a word like wall uh, yeah. in that sense, too. Okay. Uh, Kathy Sehu, Sahu, I'm sorry, Kathy, for, for the pronunciation. Whatever happened with Reagan's Star Wars technology? Is it still a big joke like the media made it sound like back in the 80s? I read the book The Dead Hand, suggested by the mysterious show notes for, was it that Dyatlov Pass episode? It was a great book and seemed to suggest that the Russians at least were afraid America would develop Star Wars, and that fear had profound impacts. But how is it regarded today? Actually, this would be great for a whole mysterious episode with SpaceX and Blue Origin info added on, along with whatever NASA is doing. There was something recently in the Wall Street Journal about how the Russians threatened to not let the U.S. have access to the International Space Station or something like that. The episode where we most prominently, I mean, we may have mentioned the dead hand in the Dyatlov Pass episode, but the one where we really discussed it was in episode 12 on the Soviet doomsday machine, the perimeter system. There was debate back in the 1980s about Reagan's strategic defense initiative or Star Wars program, as it was called in the press. Basically, for people who may not remember that, the physicist Edward Teller, who was a Nobel Prize winner, talked to Reagan. He was one of his scientific advisors and said, look, we could build in outer space a shield to protect America and everybody from nuclear war so that if the missiles get launched, they get shot down before they're able to hit. Reagan, uh, who wanted to end the threat of nuclear war, latched onto this idea. And the Soviets thought, "Uh uh-oh, America may be building this shield just for itself. And Reagan was like, no, we want to build this to protect everybody. But there's always opposition to whoever's in office. and, And so you had people you know, saying, oh, Reagan doesn't know what he's talking about, and this is destabilizing. It could actually provoke a nuclear war. If the Soviets think we're really building this, they could decide to strike before they lose the opportunity. So you had a bunch of criticism of this idea, including from various scientists and engineers who said they don't think we have the tech to do this yet. We couldn't really and won't in the near future have the ability to neutralize hundreds or thousands of missiles coming in all at once. They would point out, like, for example, missiles might set up, once they're in flight, they might set up a bunch of decoys, and you wouldn't know which are the real ones and which aren't. And so you got to take out this um, preposterously huge number of missiles. Not being an expert in these things and not being a Nobel Prize winner like Edward Teller, I don't know what the answer is, but that was what the debate was about. It's been argued that um, the Soviet Union did respond by deciding it needed to pump more money into its defense posture, and that resulted in the bankrupting of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Soviet Union. And some people have even suggested maybe that was the whole point of the Strategic Defense Initiative, to just freak them out and get them to bankrupt their economy so they would have to change their political system. However that may be, In 1993, the Strategic Defense Initiative was renamed by President Clinton to be the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, and so it continued to exist in another form. And then in 2002, it was renamed by President Bush the Missile Defense Agency, and that's its present name. So there was seen to be enough value in these programs that they continued in some form Uh, That doesn't mean every project worked, but it means that there's enough value that there continues to be missile defense technology being researched, 
And I would expect that to be folded into the Space Force now that Congress has approved President Trump's plan for a Space Force, which is long overdue. Uh, then Chris Strati writes, an episode about angels would be great. I've had some people tell me they see angels. And on the flip side, another episode about demons. Again, I've had other people who say they can see demons and know when people are possessed as well. Yeah, I would be skeptical of anyone who says they can just tell when someone's possessed. <laughs> uh, exorcists are required to rigorously test other hypotheses and not just conclude someone's possessed. We will have episodes on angels and demons in the future. One thing I would note, and we're likely to have an episode on exorcism in principle, I mean, the you know, the concept of exorcism and what actually happens, but I just personally do not want to spend a lot of time with my head in that space. You know, it, exorcism and demons are creepy and scary, and I don't like to think about it too much. So we probably won't be having ex episodes on multiple individual exorcisms. You know, sometimes we've had requests for, can you do this exorcism case or can you do that exorcism case? And I don't like to keep my head in that area a lot. And so, you know, we're likely to cover the topic in a general way, but I don't want to spend a lot of time researching individual cases of exorcism just for my own sake. It's not my nature. Mm, I'm I'm there with you. Uh, Colleen Rudolph uh, writes, is there any evidence that the Bermuda Triangle is mysteriously more dangerous to ships and aircraft than anywhere else? I haven't looked into the details yet. It's obviously on the list. I suspect that the reputation for danger for aircraft and ships there is exaggerated, but there could be some navigational or, or other nautical hazards in the area that, you know, are responsible for some of the ships that and airplanes that have vanished. Uh, Joe Trezos writes, is there any evidence spell casting of any sorts works? Yes, I know the church, of course, condemns such, but if they condemn it, does that mean that there's actual evidence that spell casting can work? This goes for any kind, divination, evocation, conjuration, witchcraft, etc. The episode that you're going to want to listen to is ep uh, initially is episode 79, which will be in January of 2020. It'll be either in the future or the past, depending on whether you're a patron and thus when you're listening to this episode. The episode is on religion, magic, psychic phenomena, and science. And as you'll hear in that episode, spells are basically unapproved religious rituals. And religious rituals can have an effect. I mean, Christian ones obviously do. That's what the sacraments are. There's also some, some evidence for psychic phenomena may work or may happen in some situations, and that could be the basis of some spells. It could really be someone thinking they're doing a spell when really they're doing something that's involving something of a psychic nature. On the other hand, that's also hotly contested, you know, and people will say, no, there's no evidence, no good evidence for psychic phenomena being real. But if there were, that could be a possible basis for, um, for some spells being effective. And then of course, demons are real. And so there are spiritual forces that could do things in connection with evocation. That's where you call up a spirit to do your bidding like a demon potentially. But how common it is to be able to successfully get a demon and then get it to do what you want, that's an entirely different question. But I can't rule out it, can't rule out the concept in principle. And so not only in episode 79, which is a general survey of these concepts, but also in other future episodes, we'll look more particularly at some of these. Okay, uh, Ramses writes, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. I just want to know your thoughts about some mysteries regarding the Great Sphinx of Giza, specifically about the belief that it is much older than currently thought due to the rainwater erosion found around the Sphinx's enclosure, harking back to a time when there was significantly more rainfall in Egypt. Also, the mystery of there being hidden chambers inside the Sphinx's head and body. Pictures from early excavations of the Sphinx seem to show a hole on the top of its head that has since been sealed up. So I've been to the Sphinx, and it's not as big as you'd think. Also, it's interesting. You can take your picture. If you have someone at the right angle holding a cell phone, you can do a force, what's known in filmmaking as a, as a process shot, where you're in the foreground and the sphinx, sphinx is in the background, and it looks like you're kissing the sphinx on the cheek. <laughs> uh, so that's always fun. I'm aware of the different theories about its age. I find them interesting, but I'm not convinced by them. 
The best evidence seems to be that the Sphinx was constructed about 2500 BC by the Pharaoh Khafre, who was the builder of the second big pyramid. And it's not the Great Pyramid of Khufu, but it's the second biggest one there. And it seems to be his face on the Sphinx. And also we found a partial cartouche that seems to indicate that Khafre was the one who built it. So I don't think it's as old as some of the theories claim. There do seem to be passages underneath the Sphinx, and they've been explored, but they don't seem to have anything weird in them. Nevertheless, the Sphinx is on the list for future episodes and has been for a long time. Uh, John Scrivo writes, what are the ingredients that make a conspiracy theory believable to the general public, even when no evidence exists to support it? Well, some conspiracies are real. I mean, that's why we have the crime of conspiracy on the law books. It's just an agreement between two or more people to do an illegal action in the future. And so here, to answer John's question, I'm going to be talking about conspiracy theories where there is no good evidence for a conspiracy existing. And I would say off the top of my head, it's a combination of a few factors. One it's something that's going to be associated with somebody else's tribe. We all have various tribes that we identify with. Uh, Some of them are political, some of them are religious, some of them are geographic, some of them are national, some of them are different kinds of social status, and we're all natively suspicious of tribes we're in competition with. So you see a lot of conspiracies. You'll have Republicans saying Democrats are doing something sinister or Democrats doing are saying Republicans are doing something sinister. That's because they're competing tribes. And so when a conspiracy theory has no basis in evidence, it's going to be something associated with a different tribe that is in competition with our tribe. And it's going to be involving an incident or a pattern of incidents that happens to harm the interests of our own tribe. If we think we've been harmed in such a way and we're in competition with somebody else, it's because they did something to cause this. Also, the idea of a conspiracy may catch on if it's similar to previously reported conspiracies, either real conspiracies from the past or other imaginary conspiracies, because then you can appeal to those as precedent for this new conspiracy. And then finally, uh, one thing that can help fuel baseless conspiracy theories is just because it's interesting to think about, and particularly with exotic possibilities, like maybe aliens are involved, or maybe demons are involved, or maybe Atlantis is involved. You know, those could also feed into a conspiracy theory that doesn't have actual evidence backing it up. Okay, I think that's where we're going to uh, cut it off here, the the questions. We still have some more questions in our buffer that we'll get to in a future episode. We'll save those. Don't worry if you if your question wasn't answered. We're, we're saving all of those. Jimmy, do we have any resources that you want to offer folks on these questions? Yes. For further resources, we'll have links to articles on Uriel, on Bilocation, on the Superstition Mountains, on David Polites. We'll have a link to episode 44 on John Hendricks, the Tennessee prophet, a link to information on cetacean strandings, on the Oak Island mystery, on the Edmund Fitzgerald, the Loch Ness Monster, U-Boat 530, natural explanations for zombies, episode 12 on the secret Soviet doomsday machine, info on the secret, on the strategic defense initiative and its present form, the Missile Defense Agency, as well as the Bermuda Triangle, Sphinxes in general, and the Great Sphinx of Giza. Excellent. So that's it from us. I want to thank all of our patrons, and especially those of you who submitted questions. You can submit feedback on this episode by going to patreon.com slash starquest or by visiting sqpn.com slash mysterious or the Jimmy Akins Mysterious World Facebook page and leave some feedback there. Send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback and you'll find all those links to jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at patreon.com slash starquest and eventually at sqpn.com slash mysterious when we release this episode to all listeners until next time jimmy akin thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world thanks dom and once again i'm dom bettinelli thank you for listening to and supporting 
Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. We hope you've enjoyed this patron's question show. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is only possible because of the generosity of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and have your questions answered on future shows for patrons, please visit sqpn.com give.